It is the 15th of March 2021. A statue is hoisted into the mid-morning sky. The statue, bedecked in a gold chain and holding the orb and scepter of state, is made entirely of granite and depicts the successor to Queen Victoria, Edward VII. It is being put into storage throughout the renovation of nearby Union Terrace Gardens, an oasis of green in the sea of grey that is Aberdeen. The statue had stood on that spot for nearly 100 years, so ubiquitous in the landscape that most people barely gave it a second thought when they walked past it or gathered underneath it. It was unveiled in 1914 to commemorate a king whose time came too late in life and he had died a mere nine years into his reign. The inscription on the statue's plinth, in Latin, reads, Shame on him who thinks this evil. Weird flex, but okay. Perhaps the evil was that his statue replaced the one of his father, Prince Albert, which was shunted further down Union Terrace, across from the theatre. But given the fact that this all happened four years after Big Edward died, it would be harsh to suggest it was because of his ego. But that's by the by, because it is 13th of October 1863, and Queen Victoria, who is just setting out on her journey to become the world's first emo, is in Aberdeen to unveil the statue that would only last 50 years before it was shunted off down the street. She's inconsolable as she pulls the cord which unveils the statue of her late husband, who had passed away two years previously, aged just 42. The life-size bronze has the consort sitting comfortably in a throne, wearing the uniform of a field marshal and draped in the robe of the Order of the Thistle. What is the Order of the Thistle? It doesn't matter. What does matter is that its motto is Nemo me impune lacessit. No one harms me with impunity. But Prince Albert was harmed with impunity because he didn't die at the hand of an assassin or in some foreign war of imperial conquest. Most current research suggests that Albert died of complications from Crohn's disease or some other chronic illness, but this is a story and stories need links, so let's go with the diagnosis that he was given at the time, the disease that his beloved wife believed that he died of, typhoid fever. This is Scotland, a podcast about history and where we made it. I'm Michael Park. It is June 8th, 1964. The people of Aberdeen are being harmed with impunity. The doctor in charge of public health in the city, Ian McQueen, is on the front page of the press and journal stating that Aberdeen must not be regarded as a leper colony. That's a pretty surefire way to have a city regarded as a leper colony. The city is rife with the disease that they believed killed Prince Albert. Riddled with it, you might say. Typhoid up the wazoo. It has been exactly one month since a tin of corned beef, or bully beef, the industrially salted meat that's the anti-social, anti-gastronomic cousin of what the rest of the world knows as corned beef, was sliced. Corned beef, along with hardtack, the world's simplest biscuit, was the staple food of the British Army for a hundred years. Salt beef is taken, ground down into a fine mince, and then packed together with gelatin until it reforms into what's best described as a shuddering loaf of barely meat. People absolutely love it. Personally, I can take or leave it, but having written the phrase shuddering loaf of barely meat, I might be more inclined to leave it. As much as people loved bully beef, they loved supermarkets even more. They'd only just made it up this far and they were taking the city by storm. Somewhere you could go and get all your messages, including your meat, in the one place. Brilliant. Ideal. Top notch. Unless you're a butcher or 
a grocer or a baker, obviously, but that's by the by because it's to the meat counter at William Lowe's supermarket that they flock to buy their cold meat. Just one short month ago, they opened a giant tin of this corned beef, sliced it on the electric slicer, and displayed it for Aberdeen's discerning public to take home and feed the bairns. And they did. They took it home and they put it in sandwiches or turned it into hash or, for some of the older ones, they might even have eaten it like it was the good old days, on a biscuit sitting in a hole up to their waist in foul water. Then people started to become ill. Explosively ill. Symptoms of typhoid include abdominal pain, fever, vomiting, and, as Billy Connolly once put it, severe attacks of the dihoria high hay. The first patient became ill on 12th of May and was hospitalised four days later. Their blood was analysed and displayed salmonella typhi. Everyone in their household was immediately admitted to hospital. In those early days, the race was on to find the source of the outbreak. Of course, you have the benefit of dramatic irony, knowing that infected corned beef is the culprit. But as each of the 503 cases who were treated in hospital were brought in, they all recalled eating cold meat of some kind. The city goes into lockdown. If only I had something good to compare that to. Schools and workplaces close and, although the offending tin of meat is long since munched, all of the evidence points to one branch of one supermarket. So hospitalised people spoke to their loved ones through closed windows. They were quarantined, dosed with antibiotics, and for all people lived in fear, they also lived in the light. Dr Ian McQueen, the man I spoke about earlier as getting the city a reputation as a leper colony, was everywhere. Radio, TV, newspapers, he told people everything that was going on in relentless detail. Admittedly, sometimes it was completely false. But he told you what he knew. At the time, people were scared. Of course they were scared. But it set a precedent for communication by health professionals in future disease outbreaks. If you're enjoying the show, you can support us on Patreon. We do loads of fun stuff for as little as £3 or $3.00 and we're going to be adding an exclusive little mini show for our patrons over the next couple of months as well. Come and get involved at patreon.com forward slash be quiet media. It is early 1964. Maybe, I mean this stuff keeps forever. On the west bank of the Paraná River, just 100 miles from the border with Uruguay, is the town of Rosario, Argentina, home of a meat processing plant designated by the Argentine government as Establishment 1A. The plant produces competing corned beef to that made by the Frey Bentos Company, 150 miles away in the town of, well, Frey Bentos in Uruguay. Plants like these have become the centre of British cuisine, producing all sorts of affordable, packageable, storable meat products that the people of Britain couldn't get enough of, to the tune of 80,000 tonnes of corned beef every year. The ships would sail, laden with tins of product, on their way to our shores down the Paraná. But to move those canned foods in hot conditions over thousands of miles took careful preparation. It wasn't just a case of scraping beef into a tin and whacking a lid on it. The cans had to be superheated to kill off any wee nasties that might be living on the outside of the tins before they were sent away. They then had to be cooled. So what did they use to cool them? Why, water from the river, of course. Was it chlorinated to kill off any wee nasties that might be living in the water? Only sometimes. Did typhoid get into a compromised can of corned beef because they were being sprayed with occasionally chlorinated water, riddled with feces and urine? You bet your bottom dollar it did. Aberdeen just happened to be the unlucky city that received an outbreak. Once the corned beef was sliced, 
It infected the blade of the slicer before being stored nicely and deliciously in direct sunlight where the bacteria could grow. And the bugs grew on the slicer too, which wasn't cleaned regularly before the outbreak, so it spread to other products. Of the 507 people who got the disease, derived from 309 city households, only four managed to stay out of hospital, while three lost their lives. There was no second wave, and while the city closed for a month, things were able to return to normal in fairly short order. But Aberdeen's reputation as a leper colony was to last. Tourism collapsed as the city's burgeoning reputation as a destination for holidaying Glaswegians disappeared, and even people travelling through were suddenly reluctant. It took a visit from the Queen and the young Prince of Wales to convince many people that Aberdeen wasn't just a plague pit, with, as one Spanish newspaper put it, corpses rotting in the streets. And as for William Lowe's, the supermarket at the centre of things, the Dundee-based chain went on to grow and grow until it was bought by Tesco in 1994, almost exactly 30 years after one meat slicer caused 507 people to become sick. When it was bought, it employed nearly 9,000 people and had nearly 60 stores all across the UK, except in Aberdeen, where its branch closed in 1967 and the company's name was Dirt. The Argentinian plant was named and shamed in a parliamentary debate and in a report published in the British Medical Journal. But yet, it was the Uruguayan plant of Fray Bentos, the tinned beef that had powered Britain's soldiers through world wars and who knows how many imperialistic incursions, that took most of the flak. Their business was handed over to the Uruguayan government in 1971, and production at the plant, which is now a UNESCO World Heritage Site, ceased completely in 1979. It wasn't all the fault of one tin of corned beef, but it certainly played its part. The trail of tiny, poor decisions leading to people dying is a fascinating object lesson in the importance of food hygiene and how reputations can be destroyed by little mistakes. The story of the Granite City's typhoid outbreak endures, so much so that the rumour goes that Aberdonians wash their hands after going to the toilet more often than anywhere else in the UK. Nothing harms them with impunity. Not anymore. You've been listening to Scotland. It was written and produced by me, Michael Park, and is a production of Be Quiet Media. The music for every episode of Scotland is by our very own delicious beef product, Mitch Bain. You can check out more of his work at mitchbain.bequiet.media. Jamie Mowat does amazing illustrations for us, which you can see in our episode art. See more and buy prints at tidland.com. Scotland is supported by Chris Lingwood, Tony B, and listeners like you on Patreon. You can get loads more from us for as little as £3 a month at patreon.com forward slash bequietmedia. You can find out more about the show and read transcripts on our website, scotlandpodcast.net. And we're on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram too. Find us by searching Scotland, a Scottish history podcast. Thanks for listening. Look after each other. Get vaccinated if you can. Wear your mask. And we'll see you next time.